Today we're joined by Sean Harris from The Matches. Uh, thank you very much for being here, Sean. It's been it's an honor. Thank you for having me. Got just a handful of questions. I've wrote them down on my so I'm not looking at I'm not like texting or anything. I've got <laughs> questions on my phone here. <laughs> we've all we've all learned how to just speak through people texting yes. while we talk to them, right? Yeah. yeah um, first question, no. So for, my first question I wanted to ask is, <clears throat> you know, back in like 2006, you've got Decomposer out, and then a couple years later, 08, you release Abandoned Hope. And it seemed like you guys had a shitload of momentum. Like, mm -hmm. Abandoned Hope, to me, is one of the best rock records ever made. Wow. It's in my top ten. And I felt like you you know, you had a ton of momentum. You're building a really dedicated audience uh, here in the U.S. And then you break up or go on hiatus. Yeah. So what led up to that? <laughs> what the hell happened? Yeah, what happened? <laughs> um... Well, in in light of the way the way you structured that question, um, it seems ridiculous <laughs> that we would have broken up. But I, I think what was I think what really was happening was um, we'd we'd spent um, we'd spent three or four years in a row doing two hundred plus dates a year, um, and we were really kind of getting into this dangerous point in our lives where. Um, we risked being men, children forever. <laughs> I'm sure, you can relate. Yes. Um, and uh, it really seemed like it was time to like see what it's like paying rent somewhere and moving out of mom and dad's house when we were in our late twenties, um, <laughs> and uh, seeing if we had what it took to make a relationship with another human being work. Um, learn to love those kinds of things. <laughs> um, and I, I'm I'm really glad that we that we kind of took a step uh, away from just being road dogs um, with our entire lives. Uh, I, I get uh, that's like the non musical answer, and it's really an answer that I can give looking back mm -hmm. at it. Um, at the at the time, there was also there was also this sort of a sense with the bands that we were touring with um, and uh, we kind of came up through the through the warp tour scene and everybody was kind of uh, it was a really great time to be a be a band that w that was I guess in a network of other bands and it really felt like we would all just kind of reach out a hand pull each other up you know bands that opened for you you would end up opening for and it there was a cyclical kind of everybody's helping each other nature mm -hmm. to the music scene and increasingly we were seeing bands um, buy their way onto tours you know fronting money for buses for bigger bands which how could a band say no to like oh this band w will buy your bus for the tour so that you can send money home to your family and pay rent somewhere and how do you say no to that you know right. and and we were seeing more and more of that and it felt like the scene was sort of um i guess just getting bought out a little bit um and it was and it was kind of hard it was hard to stay afloat in that and it felt a little yucky as well and um and it it felt it felt like we were on a ship that was about to hit an iceberg. <laughs> just in terms of not just our band, but just the whole thing. And we were like, oh let's 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 step away for a minute. Because we were from the beginning we were like we were always half reliant on the punk rock scene and being on Epitaph Records and doing warp tours, but also we would we were always um, I guess intentionally or unintentionally sort of breaking that mold too and alienating our fans yeah. that were like just punk fans or whatever. Um, and so it felt like a good time to step back and then see if what we were doing was still relevant later. So indefinite hiatus is a, is a good term for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know because <clears throat> I kind of stopped the whole full-time touring like a few years before yeah. you guys did and the buying on to tours wasn't a thing yet, but I remember hearing about yeah that happened. So, were people buying on to your tours, or were you having to try to buy on to bigger tours? We well, we never had the money to buy on to anybody's right. tour. If we did, we probably would have though. That it's just the way that things were working then. Um, and uh, 
We actually never accepted any buy-ons either. I think probably because we weren't big enough to do so. But but the tours we were trying to get onto, we kept getting bumped off of spots. Right. And by that was, bands that we were buying on. Yeah. That's like a was a big major label thing at the time, right? The, yeah. Like the majors are offering like a dashboard confessional band, right? Two hundred k for these guys to right. have main support on yeah. your tour. And it used to be, you know, in the early days of the matches and probably back in my day, like, mm-hmm. you bring out bands that you liked. Yeah. Or that were your friends. Like, sure. these guys are our buddies. Let's take them on the road. Right. And that kind of got wiped out, it sounds like. Yeah, it did. And, and it was, that was, that mentality was seeping down into the, into the indie world as well. Into the, because the indies, you know, Epitaph Records and a lot of the, uh, you know, Nitro, a lot of the, the, bigger indie labels were half owned by majors or like it, it, it was yep. it was it was kind of it was seeping into it you know yeah because i think yeah. around the time i left alkaline trio like vagrant had got bought half by universal right so they were like 49 or 51 percent owned by universal sure and they were a huge indie and i think the same thing happened with nitro mm-hmm. around that same time right yeah, yeah. absolutely and i mean Look, looking at, looking at what happened there, um, from the side of it, the, you know, from 2016 where we're sitting on these drum stools, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it makes sense that the whole thing kind of fell apart for a few years, and yeah. everyone was like, "What is, what is music worth?" We still don't really know what music is worth. Yep. But we know that when people don't have music, they want it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're not sure how much they'll pay for it. Yeah. We're not sure why or how what makes one thing worth you know one piece of music worth 40 bucks and what makes another song worth zero dollars but you know it's we people still want to come out and see it so at least there's that if you can play it live yeah you still have some security yeah Yeah, i think we are in a very strange time um in terms of recorded music like Mm -hmm. what is recorded music it's almost like a business card right yeah it's like yeah, it's like a reason for someone to or a way for someone to navigate to seeing you live or like buying a shirt or a yeah. <laughs> piece of plastic that you put the music on, yeah. you know what I mean? But the the song the song is just really it sounds gross to say it, but it is like a promotional material mm-hmm. for your business. Yeah. But which is ridiculous because the song is what it's really, really, really all about. Yeah. <laughs> but that is the thing that's in the air, and now and now it's free, and, and you fit thousands in your pocket or millions, in, infinite amounts of them in your pocket. So they don't. So there isn't a physical worth to them anymore. They're not a physical thing. But right. they were only a physical thing for a hundred years, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, with streaming, I think <laughs> Spotify. I'm a user. I'm not a huge endorser of. Spotify per se, but you've got 22 million songs right right here right like, so that is crazy right but it's forced bands to become a business right like, your business now is the business of selling tickets and selling merchandise and selling you know limited vinyl when like the the music should be the product and like that's why anybody's buying your shirt but right it is. I think phrasing it like a business card is the perfect, perfect example. It's the perfect gross way to talk about music. Yeah, like, yeah. The the but it's it's <laughs> it's kind of it's in a weird way it's taken us back a hundred years. Like we're now as a musician, we kind of exist in the same way that Scott Joplin did or something like that. Like there was a there was a whole in the eighteen hundreds. There was a whole outcry against uh, people selling bootleg sheet music. And people like copying sheet music, um, not from the artist or not from the the people that own the publishing to the sheet music, and people could just take it home and play the entertainer on their pianos, <laughs> like that's stealing music, yeah. you know. <laughs> so uh, there's there's always been stuff like this going on. It just seems wild because it's it's there's so much new technology for us to figure out, like. And and it's and it's and it's really the the phones and our headphones and the way we listen to music now has really kind of changed the our venue. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like uh and and even even 
10 or 15 years ago, their MTV and VH1 were such a big deal, like trying to make a video and get it put on that. And then so you would, you know, ostensibly pay like $40,000 to make a video to make it good enough to get on that so you could get to all these ears. And now, now with video, videos ending up on YouTube and trying to make them popular online, like $40,000 is not necessarily well spent and it's usually a horrible expenditure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, how do we make things, a video for free or very, very cheap um, that people are going to want to share and that that's just an, another thing that has no has no value but that you kind of need to do in order to share your music with anyone <laughs> yeah I, th I thought it was interesting I said like you know the venue has changed mm -hmm. and technology I mean we're doing what we're doing today and now we kind of have a digital venue now right and it's our own venue so that's yeah. kind of an awesome part of technology that like now you and I can sit here and have this conversation and we can put it on YouTube and it didn't cost us any money. Yeah, and we and we don't have to fit fifty <laughs> people in this room. Yeah. Because that would be a squeeze. <laughs> yeah. I think you'll see it seems like a, a lot of artists are headed headed that way. I don't know if you've done any of the where you can actually have an online concert now and sell tickets. I haven't done the I haven't done that. I've been playing people's living rooms uh, for the past for the past year, I've been selling tickets to living room shows. That's really cool. Online, so that's that's worked out really well, um, and that's been really fun. It's kind of almost the opposite of, of um, like if so when I'm on tour, like I'm in Indiana or something like that, right? If I book if I book a club show of me solo playing in Indiana, like a best case scenario for me is like 50 people coming out. And that's a like horrible flop for any venue. Like they're, you know, I won't make a, I won't make a dollar. Right. And the bar will fail, and they'll just basically bitch at me and give me the stink eye for like even wasting the venue's time. But if fifty people show up to a living room, it's packed. Everyone has a great time. Everyone brings their own beer, so they don't have to pay a venue for crazy prices for their refreshments or whatever. And it's like the funnest party you've ever been to. And um, and I and I can sell tickets for ten or fifteen bucks, and um, my host is a fan, so they don't want any venue cut. They're stoked to have me in their living room, and it, it's like it's just such a win-win, you know. Yeah, that's. Are you just booking that just yourself? There's a there's a website called Fanswell okay. that I use. Um, they take a small uh, they take a small percentage of the ticket sales, um, but I like it because it it. It gives kind of a, a a legitimate sheen to people entering their credit card details. Yes, to the, right, you so know what I mean. It's just like, oh, just email me your credit card. Dude. Yeah, I'll just show <laughs> here's my credit card. Yeah, go, I, just, I recently wrote a song about stealing people's credit card information, <laughs> so I figure that I should kind of put a buffer in there. <laughs> a legitimacy. <laughs> no, that seems like a really cool way to to tour, though, especially as a, as a solo artist. Yeah. And I suppose like the fans at these shows are probably a lot more engaged than you would have at, say, a bar show where there might be 80 people in the bar and 40 of them are there to see you, and the other 40 are just to hang out. So. Yeah, it's yeah, it's and it's crazy. It's it's um it's a way of scaling a potential failure into a huge success. <laughs> you know what I mean? I feel like that's that's just that's really there's so many things like that to navigate right now. How do you do, and I, I I would imagine that since everyone there is probably a pretty serious fan, you probably do fairly well on merch at yeah. those kind of shows too. Yeah, actually, yeah, much better than bars, yeah. Yeah, I know the bar shows, I mean, I have a little band and we play bar shows and like if we sell a t-shirt, like yeah. you're lucky, it's like, oh, we sold a t-shirt and a CD I today. know, I know, <laughs> yeah. So I have seen that fan swell before and it looks like a really interesting platform. Like, or, looks I, like a really cool thing to do. Yeah, I recommend it. It's been really great for me. So. Awesome. Let's see. So we've talked about what led to the breakup or mm -hmm. the hiatus. It was mm -hmm. a hiatus. It wasn't actually. You never officially broke up. I actually. I said. I said breakup, but um, 
but our guitar player said hiatus, and I'm glad he did because he's the one that got quoted. <laughs> so I remember reading hiatus. Yeah, so, yeah. So you're saying I was I was actually pissed originally when I read hiatus. I was like, I said breaking up. <laughs> he was thinking long term. He knew. Yeah. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, he's the business so, mind. <laughs> with your smart guitar player in mind. Yeah. Um, what made you guys decide to get back together? Um, we actually. Our first record that we put out on Epitaph, um, they actually li they licensed from us, so we had recorded it a year before signing. So we ha so we had the the masters reverted back to us after a decade, and uh, we actually got together n not even because of that, but it just so happened that the first time all four of us got together, I'd seen the guys here and there, um, but the f we we all got together and had breakfast. Um, at Rudy's Can't Fail Cafe, which is Mike Durant's nice. <laughs> cafe in Emeryville, uh, we we got together to have just to have breakfast there. And Matt mentioned like three quarters of the way through breakfast when the check was coming, he's like, "Oh yeah, I think um, our record is like ours again." And um, after the matches, everything, every record I've I've done, I've been able to um, to do at least a limited run on vinyl. And so I had to my own record collection on vinyl and I, I you know I collect records from bands that I like it's it's a way that I like to support bands that I like cuz I still like to give them my money but I'm not necessarily like a like a t-shirt wearer so I I you know I I I like to buy the vinyl cuz then I know that you know of my $20 like roughly 10 of it's going to go to a band that I like and hopefully that'll allow them to tour to me <laughs> yeah, and awesome. that kind of thing so um uh so i was like well, let's put it out on vinyl that would be great and then i can add it to my collection <laughs> <laughs> and uh and the guys thought that was a good idea and um once we once we decided to do that um we we're like oh maybe we'll do one show in the bay area um just to kind of if nobody knows about it, then at least the people that come to the show will buy the rest of the vinyl, right. and then we won't, don't have inventory sitting in somebody's garage. And uh, and that kind of turned into um, that sold out really quick. We added another date, and we just it kind of snowballed. And then we're like, well, I guess I think Chicago would work if we sold out four San Francisco dates, <laughs> and then uh, we ended up doing New York as well, and a couple other cities. So um, yeah, we ended up doing like a little tour. We did. I think ten shows that year, and then um, and then the next year we did one one show in the Bay, or actually no, two shows at the Fillmore, and we'd never done two nights at the Fillmore, and the first night sold out so quick, we're like, oh wow, cool, let's add another one, and then we just had we had a really great time doing it, and it was really fun to do the band kind of on our terms where it fit into our lives, um, as opposed to having it, you know. Basically, being a how can I ex express what it feels like to be on tour without seeming ingrateful? <laughs> it's like you're you really you do get chained to it, and it totally changes your life and all the relationships you have with people that are that you're dependent on and that are dependent on you, your family, etc. Yeah. You you just disappear. Yeah, I mean, you do you definitely reach a point where the band is in control? Yeah, like nobody in the band is in nobody control. from the, ba the yeah. band. Yeah, is driving. You're part you, of this, and like, you're just hanging just on. A, just a train, just barreling. Yeah, yeah, and you just kind of hang on and drink IPA. <laughs> 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 so, um, so yeah, it fe it feels really good to to be able to to do shows on our own terms i mean you know exactly how that is too a hundred percent yeah yeah that's awesome yeah so do you think you have like uh, now that you can kind of just it's not your life mm -hmm. it's just something you do now purely for fun right do you appreciate it more now than you did oh i definitely do i definitely do um i mean that's the reason we all started being in bands too you know there was when we when we started playing music, there was no thought that the music was going to be a be a job or a, anywhere near a full time job. We were just oh, hopefully I can play this for somebody, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, so that there's all that thrill again, and there's um, there's a really nice open end um, where 
you know, we could potentially make new music. Um, we can play, you know, we're on, I'm on, we're on tour right now doing a 10 year anniversary of our second record, um, which we never got to play in full. Um, some of the songs I, I think we only played maybe once or twice live and, and never all at, all at once, which was sort of the, you know, the vision when you put together a record, this is the order you hear them in and stuff. But, um, you know, we were mostly doing opening, you know, we were mostly opening for other bands. So we'd have a half hour set and we'd just kind of try to chuck the, the best yeah. singles at people so that <laughs> they had the, we had the best chance of, you know, appealing to whatever audience we were playing for. So it's neat to be able to kind of come back and, um, be <laughs> indulgent in a way that makes the audience pleased. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it's cool that a lot of bands are doing that now. And I think the fans really enjoy it because it's something your fans, you know, they've been fans for a decade or more and they've never seen that. Right. So yeah. it's, it's like a whole new experience for you and the fans. Totally. And I, I agree when you said, um, like playing music now, you know, after getting back together, it feels more like it did when you started. Right. And I felt the same thing when I started playing again yeah. with a couple bands. Like, because you don't need anything, because when you're making a living from the music, you need something. Right. And now you're just doing it for the pure reason that you want to do it. Right. Which is awesome. Right. Like, I felt that when you said that. Totally. Like, did, did you, when you guys, um, uh, have you, when you're writing new stuff, do you, um, who do you feel like beholden to? Do you know, does that make any sense? Like are, are, when, when writing, it's, it's something that I've kind of struggled with. The Matches did a, a two song, seven inch, and I probably wrote 40 songs before it wow. felt like I had written a Matches song, <laughs> but I was trying to write a Matches right. songs, but it was like, I guess when we first formed the band, there was no template. Really, the only thought was like, I hope we can produce this in a way that like allows us to get on Warp Tour. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> and so if there was any template, it was kind of mimicking some of the sounds and production value of you know bands that were doing well in the punk scene at that time. Um, but that was really the only template or expectation. And then subsequently, it was like, you know, the label wanted something from you, but you knew that your fans wanted something from you. But now that there's no label to want something right. from you. It's, it's really <laughs> like, and then, and then the fans, they, it's, there's a weird thing where they, they, they want something from, they expect something from you. There's a certain thing that they like about your band. Right. Do you necessarily know what that is? And also, they also want to be surprised and hear something fresh and new. And those sometimes seem like fully contrary um, requests. <laughs> but it, the, they, they aren't necessarily. But how do you approach that? That's a great... Because I think as the artist, you have really no idea what your fans find special about you. Right. Because so many times, the fan favorite songs are your least favorite song. <laughs> totally. You know, a lot of times, <laughs> now that was the case for the Popes, is like, a lot of our least favorite songs initially were the ones that the fans grabbed and they really? loved. Really? So yeah. It's really hard to know, like, so what What do they want from you? Right. And it, as the artist, it, I think it's almost impossible to know. Right. So I think when you're writing, I think the only thing you can try to do is just make yourself happy. Right. Like, try to write what would be your favorite record right now? Sure. Like, so the matches, you might put it in the box of somewhere in the ballpark of punk rock. Yeah. But you guys hit so many different genres anyway, like, it's a pretty wide box. Right. So and like, that was a big ballpark to start with, too. <laughs> so, somewhere in the neighborhood of punk rock. <laughs> yeah. Like, so what kind of punk rock record would you want to hear right now? Right. Like, that if I'm... And then you, you factor in the 10 years rock. later, too. But then you think about the nostalgia you have for the old stuff as mm -hmm. well. It's crazy, yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah, I think it's almost impossible to write like with somebody else's perspective in mind. I think you just gotta write like what you want to hear. Right. Whenever I write songs, I'm just trying to write a song that's gonna get stuck in my head that I want to listen to repeatedly. Yeah. 
And I know for, as like a solo artist, I probably listen to my music more than anybody else does. So I don't have a big audience. I do too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, what do I want to hear today? Yeah. I'm going to write that. Yeah. Is it funny how there's a stigma against that? Against like driving down the street to Dairy Queen listening to your own song. Right. You kind of have to close the windows and like look around, you know? I do it all the time. Though. I do too. Yeah. You have to. I mean, yeah. people that people that say, people that laugh at you for that, they're basically saying like you shouldn't you shouldn't be the audience for what you are making. Right. Which seems crazy yeah. to me. Like yeah. I'm the perfect audience for what I make. Yeah, if you don't love it, then why should anybody else <laughs> yeah, love it? Yeah, like, I should love it the most yeah. cuz yeah, so. <laughs> I, I totally agree. And I I will shamelessly listen to my own music and Yeah. I'm on Spotify and I know like people can see what you're listening to and like Half the time you're going to see me on Spotify, like, listening to my own shit. Right. I don't care. (laughs) I don't care. Don't turn it on private. (laughs) I'll be listening to the matches, or I'll be listening to my own stuff. Awesome. (laughs) Uh, Go ahead and give me a clap there. That sucked. There. It's hard to clap good on demand. It really is. (laughs) You're just clapping. It's easy. Yeah, you don't think about it, but usually, like, the third clap is the best. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Three claps. <laughs> but, like, when do you clap once in life other than when he says clap once? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you only clap once yeah. for Ken. <laughs> <laughs> if you only clap once, that means you didn't really like whatever you're clapping for. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have done that at a concert before. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of um, a producer friend that we worked with, Jerry Finn. Um, the clapping once at a concert reminded me of him, his saying, because bands would always ask him, like, what'd you think? Like, when he'd come to see shows, and he'd say, you put out a lot of sound. <laughs> so I'll let you use that phrase, or Jerry will let you use that phrase if you need it when bands come up to you and say, what'd you think? Put out a lot of sound. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. That was secrets out. Every, everyone's got their own, everyone has their own version of uh, the thing that you say to bands when you're not exuberant about the yeah. performance. Like, you, you've either seen it before or it wasn't their best show, um, or you didn't like it. Everyone's got their own version. That's tough. Like, <laughs> what do you do when... Do you have a lot of fans that like to send you music? Like, their yeah. music? Yeah. That To me, that's always a tough situation. Right. Because a lot of times they'll... I don't know if you get messages like, can I send you? Do you tell them, like, what if I don't like it? Or do you, are you just always nice? I just say, I say send it to me. But I'm, I'm, I'm usually, I usually try to be honest with them. And I hope it doesn't break their heart. <laughs> but, like, you know, and just recently somebody sent me the, their demo. And I said, um, I said, Oh, rad. Reminds me of, and I said a band that it kind of reminded me of so that they would feel that I was, like, getting a sense of it mm-hmm. and that I listened to it. And then I was like, um, I like the drums and guitar. It seems to me the vocals could use some work. Um, you might try, you might try, you know, getting some vocal lessons or working on your pitch. And then I just send it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean... I think that's cool that that you're honest. Though. I I try to do the same. Like I hope they don't think I'm a dickhead. But why else would they be sending it? I yeah. mean, that, maybe they're sending it because they want you to be like, "Holy shit, come on tour with me." But if that's not the case, then the best thing you can do for them is to say why they're not going to be able to come on tour with right. you. You know, yeah. because maybe they because maybe they will. I actually <laughs> have known um, some fans that have that have really progressed as musicians and eventually put out something that I'm like, whoa, this is really, really good now and sent it to people or labels for them and kind of started introductions. So it does happen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, what would you say if 16 year old Sean Harris like sent you now his I'd be like, I, tape. The guitars and drums sound good. You should work on the vocals. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, people progress. progress. I think I, I'm very much the same where, like, I try to give honest feedback. Yeah. Because if you're not, then what are you doing for them? Like, you're, you're, yeah, totally. And hopefully that's what they're looking for when they, like, 
It's really cool, I think, when people share their art with you because it's a really vulnerable thing to do. Like, yeah. th- I made this. What do you think? Totally. So totally. that's neat. <clears throat> yeah, and it's it, cool it's, that you listen to it and respond. It's a, it's a. I mean, it's a cool time where like really anybody that you want to get in touch with, unless they're really reclusive, um, you know, you kind of can just send a message straight to anybody's phone yeah. and they'll get it wherever they are in the day <laughs> with Facebook Messenger or just with a tweet or whatever, um, which is, it's bizarre. I mean, it, it felt like it felt like people that were, you know, I guess accomplished and, and had careers that, you know, you looked up to were totally uh, off base and and a few steps away from ever being present in your world a decade ago. And now you really just have to sack up and message them yeah. or figure out a reason to do so. Like, I like this artist named Ezra Furman. And uh, I have his email address. Actually, <laughs> a friend of mine sh- shoots his videos or shot a video for him. And I was like, hey, I'm, I've got a project. At the time, I was like, actually, I just wanted an excuse really to get his email and I was like oh I've got a project that I you know I'm calling on a couple people to do guest vocals or whatever I really didn't have a project I just (laughs) kind of didn't want to seem creepy so he sent me his email and it's just his email just sits there and I'm like I have no no reason to contact him but I'm like can't wait to make one (laughs) you know (laughs) maybe he'll watch this (laughs) hopefully he does yeah what's funny because that's how I got you here today was I didn't. I don't know you guys. Yeah. Um, I don't know anybody that knows you, but I went to your Facebook page and I sent you a message. And I thought it was so cool that you reached out. Dude, I'm doing this video <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah. I heard your band for the first time when I was like at the end of middle school. So wow. um, you're old, but um, I'm old. no, I was. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I am old. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I was. I was a fan, so it felt. It felt really neat to have you reach out, and I was like. Got to make this happen. The rest of my band um, didn't, doesn't fly into Chicago till later tonight, so just me this time. <laughs> yeah, I, I tried to con- like. I was very excited when you guys got back to me and said you were gonna come. I think we were having a band practice down here, one of my bands, and I was just like, "Yeah, the matches are gonna come." Like I was just like freaking out. <laughs> That's so. so good. I'm trying not to be too much of a no. It, it's it's that. cool. I did it. I honestly, um, I was like. When you said you were a fan of the band, I like kind of had to like sit down and turn around for a minute, and I was like, "He's either really a fan of the band, or he's really smart in like getting me to respond." Because you just because you just appealed to my ego in such a good way that I was like, "Oh man, this is great! I have to be able to get there now." Um, so yeah, I guess if you're trying to reach out to someone you're not a fan of, it's you should. Just say you're a fan. You should, you should really, you should really be a real fan. They'll be able to tell as soon as you, you know, open yeah. your mouth. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's pretty easy to tell, like, yeah. if you're faking it or not. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you guys are cool. I like your your songs. Um, <laughs> we covered a lot of my questions. I want to talk just a little bit about the song "Life of a Match," okay. and you played it here today. And did you have anything to, like, the video for that song is, like, clips from a bunch of bands from the early 2000s. With, yeah, yeah. Um, was that your concept? Or was it somebody else's idea, that video? Uh, yeah, it was my idea. Your idea? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, and I, didn't, I didn't know how it would fly, because obviously the entire video is a huge copyright infringement. <laughs> I wondered how that was. Um, yeah, the... The I had the idea and I was like I wonder if this is even doable because, um, we we basically just took one second clips from all the bands that we toured with um, when our you know career started. It was mostly mostly Warped Tour bands, um, and uh, and we we edited it all together so that um, their their vocals synced up with the lyrics from our song. Um, I, I think it was a, it was, it was, we used the video, part of my concept was to use it as a crutch, because just in case Life of a Match didn't sound like it came from <laughs> the same band or the same scene that we had come up in, 
that video, put it in that world. Right. And so it was a little bit of a crutch for me. It made me feel like, oh, well, you know, like, you know, at, like all the punk blogs and stuff, like, we'll still like this. <laughs> <laughs> even if, even if I've totally missed the mark with the song. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, we, we just, we just used all the videos. We didn't, we didn't ask anybody for permission. And I just, when we put it out, um, I wrote up a thing uh, that just said, you know, this video is kind of um, honoring all these bands, some of them still together, some of them broken up, that that brought us out on tour and came out together. And I tagged as many of them as I could, as I could find, and the guys from the bands and stuff. So I was thinking if we came out, that, like, giving a hug to them, yeah. that nobody would really <laughs> give us the finger back. And, and it, it worked out. Nobody, nobody cared. And you know, half of those labels are defunct right now anyway, and I don't think anybody was going to be like, give us all the money you made off of that video, because obviously <laughs> there's... <laughs> there's a 35 cents I got yeah. YouTube streaming. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> With point zero zero two cents per, or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, and, we, and in, the, in, in the lyrics of the song, we talk about all the bands that broke up and the t-shirts that I had to throw out when I cleaned my parents closet my closet out from my parents house when they moved and and um, obviously we also broke up so we we're making fun of ourselves in the midst of that it, it just felt like a good place to be self referential yeah I think it's a great tune like Thank I you. like the song I like the video especially because I'm in it for like a second <laughs> yes <laughs> and I, when I first saw it I'm like oh shit there I am <laughs> awesome. I was like I'm in the fucking matches video <laughs> amazing but um, I think the song is like sounds like a, just a natural progression from Abandon Hope to where you would be now, you cool. know, eight years later. Right. Great. That was that was the hope. <laughs> well, it worked on me. Great. Awesome. <laughs> While you were in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've covered just about everything I wanted to cover, although I had... One strange question. This is like a real fan question. This would be like something you'd ask um, the Beatles or something. But <laughs> like, what's in 2016 when you're not like out rocking and on tour? Yeah. What's a, just a regular day in the life of Sean Harris in 2016? Um, oh man, they're all so different. I, I the entire last year. Me and my wife spent with our Pomeranian traveling around the United States um, in an Airstream trailer awesome. that we found in the desert and renovated, and then we got married and went on a really long honeymoon, um, and I recorded um, my first solo album, uh, St. Ranger. I recorded a bunch of that in the Airstream, in canyons and fields, so literally every day was looked very different and was in a different st state. and. Um, yeah, so that was that was really fun. I got to do basically a slow motion tour. I did like two shows a month. I did house shows, and um, and between there, I was just recording and writing. And um, you know, when we ran out of money, we would just stay still for a little bit until either my wife wrote an article or edited a video that made money, or I sold some stuff on the web store, and then we would like. <laughs> Put it in the gas tank and go somewhere else. That's awesome. And it was a great, it was a great time. And then, um, and then the matches um, got had a, a song used in a Lipton commercial, so I had a little bit of money um, at the end of last year. And then we bought a house. <laughs> um, it's not that much money. It was a, a broken down old house in the middle of the desert out near Joshua cool. Tree. So my day, if you're asking me about a day in the last couple months, um, I've been looking up YouTube videos on how to like refinish floors and put up drywall and that kind of redo the roof. And um, we're renovating our own house right now. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we're and then our plan is to uh, rent that out for a good part of the year. I'm building a little studio in my basement too. Cool. I also have a basement. I have like the only basement in Castro in California. Um, so. Yeah, hopefully when it's done, it'll be kind of like this, and maybe I can have you as a guest sometime. Yeah, I'll come to Sean's <laughs> rock room. Yeah. <laughs> so before I have one last question, I ask all bands, but is there anything you wanted to talk about 
that I didn't ask, like anything you wanted to go over? Mm. Oh man, not off the, not off the top of my head. But that's because I was like flowing with our conversation. Cool. I, there weren't any. Had a good flow. Weird pockets. It was <laughs> a good flow. Yeah. <laughs> so we ask every artist this question. Oh, I did want to ask where you got oh. your um your your chairs upstairs. That are around the table, the canvas colored. Um, oh, um, there's covered. A, yeah. There's a it's a little store that's up, um, not far from here. But I can I think that you can buy stuff online and send it there really cheap. Oh really? Mm -hmm. Those are cool chairs. Thank you. They have great Might chairs. Take them out. That's Stephanie Wysocki that you're hearing there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Bra Braxton? Braxton. Braxton yeah. Outlet or something. Uh -huh. Okay, that was the only renegade thought I had. Yeah, they were. So. <laughs> they're kind of knockoffs of like. Yeah, Ames chairs. Of big Ames. brand yeah. chairs, so they're like sixty bucks a piece or something. Awesome. Yeah, I like the canvas covering. I've never seen those. Those would look good in our house when we finish it. <laughs> cool. <laughs> this question, we usually phrase it. Um, in one word, describe your experience in the rock room. Now you have to give a word. You can explain that word if you want, but one word. Yeah. Um, oh God, one word. Let's see. Uh, do you have a dictionary laying around or something? I want to <laughs> kind of flip until I see it. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to say umami. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there was a, it, I had a, I had an, I had an all around and, uh, a well-rounded and savory <laughs> experience. That's uh, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All I right. did. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed our conversation and it was really cool to get to talk to you. Thank you. I enjoyed I would have liked it before. if there were cameras here or not, and awesome. I'm, I'm glad that we're friends now. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and it was fun to play the songs, too. <laughs> the feeling is mutual. Cool. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Sean. Right on. Thank you, Mike. We'll wrap it up. Cool. <laughs>